Good afternoon and welcome back to our last webinar in our series of Teaching ELL ESL to Multi-Level Classrooms. My name is Brenda Huey Rosas and I am the ESL Specialist at Thesis International. I have a bachelor's degree in Chinese and a master's in teaching ESL or teaching English to speakers of other languages, TESOL. I also have 10 plus years of experience in the classroom, specifically in multi-level ESL classrooms. Today we are going to be talking about speaking to build writing fluency for ESL ELL classrooms. We here believe that writing is a skill that we easily integrate with different skills, such as reading, listening, and speaking. So when teaching writing, you always want to be working with another skill along with writing. Just like a healthy diet, you never want it to just be all meat or protein. You always want a balanced diet. In that way, you want your ESL students to always be strong in reading, writing, listening, as well as speaking. And writing is sometimes the hardest to build up because it takes um, a lot of different skills for them to get to that writing fluency, even native speakers. So when we practice writing, we want to also read to write, write to read, listen to write, write to listen, speak to write, write to speak. In that way, you're integrating all the skills. So let's start with reading to write. So anytime you are talking about some kind of writing that you're going to be doing, you may want to start with a reading to give them some kind of background information. Or maybe that was the reading of the unit. But they are reading to then write about the unit. For example, if the reading is about the Statue of Liberty, you may want to have them write about freedom, the theme that comes out of the reading. And in that way, they can connect it back to the Statue of Liberty and make those connections but work on two skills at the same time. You could always have them write about freedom first, maybe some freedoms you want to have, and then have them read about the Statue of Liberty. In that way, again, you're working with the two skills. Listening to write and writing to listen. We can do listening in a lot of ways. A teacher can read a reading to students they are listening. You could have a video started off. Um, you could also have an audio file. But students have to listen in their mainstream classes. They have to be able to pull out important information in order to take notes. So we want them to be able to listen. But listening to write will then practice both skills. For example, if they listen to a video or watch a video, they can then write or take notes or write a response in response to the video. You could also have them write to listen. So first, they do a writing, like a free write about a topic, and then they watch a video about something, or they listen to the reading that they're going to be working on. Speak to write. Speak to write is one of my favorites. Um, I use this often in my classrooms. The reason is there are some students that are more comfortable speaking. So students that may have been learning ESL or English for a while, so long-term English learners, they do a lot better speaking than writing. So you might ask them a question, have them speak about it, it then prompts their ideas so they can then put it in writing. You may have students that are you know, lower level write to speak because they're more comfortable writing um, because they haven't had that, that practice of speaking. So you really want them to start writing and then have them speak about their writing to then lead to more writing. So these are some ways just to, integ to integrate the different skills. But there are also different levels of writing, meaning word level, phrase, sentence level, that then moves into paragraphs, stories, and then essays, and of course, the long one, the research paper. But if you help the students with all four skills, and you help them through the writing process, which we will be talking about later on, students will have a better chance of not plagiarizing those essays or research papers. They'll be more confident in using their own language to write. Let's move on to schema building. This is how you might start off a unit, but schema building with some writing. So you may start with an informal writing prompt. And the reason I say informal is because, number one, you haven't taught them any grammar. You haven't even taught them anything about the unit in general. So it's more fair if you make it an informal writing prompt. And it needs to be related to the topic or essential question. For example, if the essential question is favorite vacation spot, I'm sorry, that's not a question, but what are your favorite vacation spots? Or the topic is vacation spots. 
you can have them just do an informal writing about their favorite vacation spots or somewhere they want to go. That informal writing can then lead to a speaking activity. But if we call it informal, we only want to really grade for content. So give them a score out of 10. How did they do for content? Maybe how did they do with the writing fluency and how does it sound? But it's best not to check their individual grammar and dock off points for those things or spelling even. So this helps them get their writing going. Then it leads to a speaking activity. In past webinars, we talked about fluency lines and how students can share their writings with other students and rotate and rotate. Maybe they start with their technology or their paper, reading it to their classmate, and then they switch, switch, switch after three rounds, maybe just notes, or maybe it just turns into only their ideas. But the idea then is when they present, they're speaking more fluently about it which then they could put onto paper later on, maybe at the end of the unit, because the topic's pretty much the same and consistent throughout the unit. So again, writing then leads to speaking. Speaking then again can lead back to the writing. So we have um, vocabulary and writing. In our past webinars, we talked a lot about vocabulary activities. Uh, one of them was carousel writing. So carousel writing is really about story writing, but students are only working at the sentence level. They're working with a single vocabulary list and trying to put words in a sentence to correlate to the story. So as stories move around and rotate, they're adding one sentence at a time. But here they're working on reading because they have to understand what the sentences were that came before it vocabulary as well as writing. Then of course at the end you want them to read their stories, the one they started on. Pick a card is a vocabulary activity where they have a random set of cards, they pick one. With that word they need to then make a sentence, again working at sentence level. Race for sentences is sentence writing but it's a race against other students. They can do one word at a time or three, four, five words in one sentence at a time but they're getting it checked consistently by the teacher really great informal assessment for the teacher. But again, it's still writing, even though it's sentences and vocabulary. So sentence writing is something you always want to do. Sometimes we do vocabulary and then you have them memorize the definition, but really have them write sentences. This helps their writing fluency also. Story writing as a class, work together on a single story. When I do story writing as a class though, I really like to use images. Images create things for stories. For example, you see here a scuba diver in the water, probably somewhere nice like Hawaii. Um, so the students can write about a vacation spot, about Hawaii, about scuba diving, really getting the students on that same page um, as far as creating a story. Now you could always use an image, but make them write a paragraph on the topic. So what is your favorite vacation spot? Maybe they have no ideas, so this will prompt some ideas about a Hawaiian beach, going snorkeling finding underwater creatures. Uh, and then you also have a paragraph where you can ask them a question. Maybe they have to defend uh, an argument, and that's a little bit higher level, but it also leads to writing fluency. Afterwards, you always want to connect it back to speaking. Have them share that paragraph, that those sentences, that story with the class. Grammar. Grammar is something that usually gets in the way of writing. So I have a student who is really strong in speaking. She always asks me, Miss Huey, before I write, can I, can I speak about it? Can I talk about it? Because again, she is comfortable with speaking. Every time she tries to start typing or writing, she gets caught up with the grammar, gets stuck, checks spell check, tries to fix the grammar sentence by sentence. And I tell her, just let your writing flow. Just write how you speak. And even if it's incorrect, we'll change it later. So grammar is something you always want to help them with, but don't let them get, it, get, get stuck on it so it gets in the way of their writing and creating writer's block. So grammar is something we always like to teach in our units. We want there to be a focus so that teachers don't teach everything under the sun all at one shot. So you really want to try like maybe it's only past tense we're working on today. Some grammar activity ideas, um, one of my favorites is noticing. Noticing is super easy, doesn't take any um, preparation on the teacher's part. You have a reading, okay, let's notice all the past tense verbs. Obviously, you want to make sure that story is in past tense first. 
but let's circle or highlight all the past tense verbs that you can find. Students are then seeing how they're used in context. You can ask them questions. Which ones are regular past tense? Which ones are irregular past tense? But noticing is very useful. If you see these flashcards in this image, I really like to do yes, no, or either, or. So either, or might be something like past tense versus present tense. But the idea is they're, they're only working on two note cards. The teacher gives a word like ran. If it's yes, no, and you're asking, is this a past tense verb, students will hold up their cards, yes, or they'll hold it up, no. Instant assessment for the teacher to see what everyone's answering. Number one, everybody's participating. Number two, they're not really so scared of their answer because they're not saying it out loud. And really, you're the only one looking. They might look at each other, but you know, can't help that. The other one is past tense versus present tense, where they actually have to choose a tense. But still, again, it's either or choosing one. But great activities for low-level ESL students, maybe even high level if you're working on higher grammar, but really great for that low level. And then in a multi-level classroom, it works even better because it gives those lower level students a safety net. Grammar should always be taught and then practiced in some kind of activity. I know there are a lot of grammar worksheets out there. We have nothing against them. We just really know that they need to practice it in some kind of activity, maybe with speaking, writing, or even listening. So the idea here is that you can do the grammar focus and then move it into writing. So the prompt has to all, always lead to that grammar focus. For example, if we're working on simple past tense, the prompt could be, tell a story about a time you were told you could not do something, so what did you do? Verbs in past tense. So the students will write, and then after they write, they need to go back and notice all the past tense verbs and make sure they spelled them correctly or used past tense when they should. Those are some examples of how to work with grammar in writing. Next, we're going to move into the writing process. So we believe strongly in the writing process. Anytime you write, you always want to take them through the writing process. It's very dangerous to give a student a prompt and say, go write, especially if they take them home to do it, because then you come back with plagiarized papers. And that really doesn't do anything to help the students except get them in trouble. And you really want to scaffold their writing, help them in every step so they don't go straight to plagiarism as their backup plan. You always want to have them feel safe in their writing and feel confident. So in the writing process, the first one is pre-writing or plan. Now we talked a lot about different brainstorming activities in past webinars, um, but again, we're gonna bring up the brainstorming activities. A lot of different ways to build background. Um, number one, easy, have them research. I like to encourage students to research in their own language. If they research in their own language, number one, they understand it and they won't plagiarize. They might translate it and then copy from a translator, but they won't particularly, you know, specifically plagiarize. Um, have them research, have them take notes um, in their own words. That will help them um, have something to work with. Speak about your ideas. I uh, really like students to speak out loud. They may not be comfortable at first speaking, but if you do speaking with every unit or you know once a week, students will get more and more comfortable speaking. They will feel comfortable that it is okay to make mistakes while speaking. Drawing images or images in general. If you look at this image, you'll see all these images of maybe Hawaii or some kind of vacation spot. I can do a digital one where I brainstorm uh, collage it, and then I go up and I speak from these images. Again, I didn't write it down first, so I'm speaking from the images, getting that speaking fluency going to then write, and it'll lead to writing fluency. Draw the images. You don't want to do digital, have students draw. There are some students that think in images. These are your artists. Have them do that. If they don't think in that, have them do words. So for me, I would do words. I'm not an artist, but I might do the brainstorming digital. Um, image activity. Free writing is something I love to do. There are a lot of different definitions of free write. My definition of free write is have them write. It's okay to use some words in your own language if you can't remember um, or don't know a word in English. It's okay to draw some images, but you obviously want them to try as much in English, plug in you know, another language or an image. And free writing is something that can be done where you have students race against each other, so it becomes a fun activity. 
Say, okay, everyone, I'm going to give you 10 minutes. At the end, you have them actually count out the words to see if their fluency is increasing each time or how they're doing up against other students. Someone like me, I'll have 10 pages, whereas someone will have three sentences. So you want students to increase writing fluency and length as they do these free writing practices. And the most important thing about free writing is do not grade it. Give them points for doing it if you want to, but do not grade it. Do not have them worry about grammar or spelling, really just to get their ideas. From that free write, have them talk about it. Have them speak about it. We talk a lot about brainstorming maps, brainstorming T-charts. This is one way to organize your ideas. Again, it's not in any order, so students don't need to feel scared about doing a map. But here you can see my Hawaiian vacation, the islands, music, you know, different things like that, maybe the beaches. Um, so the idea here is students are mapping their ideas to then talk about it. A lot of times we just get stopped at the brainstorming map. Have them take it to the board, project it, speak from these ideas. See what sentences they come up with. Again, build that speaking fluency. Moving on to drafting. It is very important when we talk about drafting for students that they are writing some kind of outline or notes. Now we're putting it in some kind of order. But even before that, have them speak about it. So you have that brainstorming activity. You had that brainstorming collage. You had that free write. They're speaking. Have another student take notes or nowadays you have technology, have them record themselves speaking and then have them take notes from their recording. The reason for that is as a listener, whoever the listener is, they'll pull out what's important or interesting. Those are the things you want them to include in their writing. Sometimes speakers ramble. Those will be taken out when they do their outline or their notes. So you can see what other people thought were most important, then take those put those into your notes. Now put them in a linear fashion, maybe in the form of an outline. Any kind of outline is fine, as long as it's linear in fashion. Now something that's not linear is note cards. Maybe in a research paper or a more complicated essay where you have examples that you need to pull, put them all on different index cards. Then put the index cards in order, shuffle it around, then speak again. From your outline, notes, or index cards, have someone listen to you or again record yourself and then you can put it in the right order, and then you can begin your draft. But by that time, when you finally put words to a paper in the form of an essay or a story or a research paper, you will have spoken about it so many different times that it becomes a little more natural to you and it's easier to write and it'll, they'll stay away from writer's block. Please remind them anytime you draft, mistakes are okay. This is where students get stuck the most again with grammar, spelling. How does that work? Let me look it up. And they stop writing. So let them write, make all the mistakes that they need to, and then later correct them. The next one is about revision. So when we revise, we always want to make it better. Now there are different ways to make things better. For example, we can add vocabulary. I always encourage my students, when you rewrite, when you draft, who cares about the words you use? Do it in your speaking. Maybe it's simple. It's okay. Now get your thesaurus out. Change some of your simple words or phrasing. Add that vocabulary in. You can give students lists of vocabulary and make them put that vocabulary in their writing because it is related to the topic. That's very helpful also. Um, students who have better vocabulary in the writing, of course, will make it stronger, but you don't want them to add that at the beginning. You want it to come later if it doesn't come naturally. Add examples. We all know that examples really make a paper well supported. So have students notice again. Have them highlight the examples, circle them. If they don't have enough, then they can add them. But this is where they would add the examples to make it a stronger paper. Transition words need to be taught, especially for EL students. Um, the idea here is you're teaching transition words. You're teaching them where to put it in a draft. You may even have to start with first, second, third. Later, you could start with more complicated structures of transition words, but make it a focus of the paper so that they then put them in. This will again make their uh, paper a lot higher in level. Rearrange sentences. On that draft, have them draw arrows. Maybe this doesn't belong. Maybe cross out, but have them do that on the drafting stage. It is okay for the paper to look like this image, all messy, all messed up, but it's making it a better paper. Now, lastly again, back to speaking. Read it out loud. 
does it flow? This is a great time if you didn't use the recording method earlier, have them record their reading of this paper because it's close to the final draft stage. Does it flow? Does it sound good? Do I need to add more bigger words? Um, what do I need to do with it? But when they listen back, they'll have a better idea of where they are. All right. Next, editing. Now, editing is something we have to be very careful about when it comes to ELL students because you can check your own work, but as an ELL student, you're always struggling with the same grammar focuses. So you may know because your teacher told you what, you're, what you need to work on, but if you don't know, you're gonna think it sounds great all the time. So, peer editing is something I like to do. I like to actually do it with multi-level classrooms, but if it's not structured well, it can get a little out of hand. So what you want to do is make sure as a teacher, remind them or teach them a grammar focus. Going back, okay everybody, today we worked on, or this unit we worked on, past tense. Please check the reading or writing that you have in front of you specifically for past tense. Again, a noticing activity. If they can only focus on that and fix that, that helps the writer already. But Sometimes, if you have low-level students, they just start correcting it incorrectly, like how they would write, and that doesn't help the students. Or they know they're low-level, and then they don't even correct anything because they can't even understand their reading. So the idea is that you want students to notice the specific grammar focus and only work on that. The higher-level students, you don't want them correcting everything on a low-level student's paper because that really hurts them. It hurts their confidence. Even as a teacher, you don't want to correct everything right off the bat. Focus on a specific focus that you taught. Make them responsible for that. Then next unit, move to the next focus that you taught and keep going like that. But they're going to read each other's writing. Maybe they add a comment about something they need to work on and something they did well. But the idea here is that you're specifically giving them guidance for what to work on when you're editing. When you're editing your own work later, double check capitalization, punctuation, spelling always. Um, Sometimes the computer will show you corrections that you need and they aren't always correct. Um, read it aloud again or even have someone else proofread it, but clean it up. That is the editing process. Sometimes students say, oh, I edited it, and I, they didn't actually make any corrections. Publishing. Now this is the fun part. So after they edit it, they make a final draft. You can have them just turn it in digitally or written, but we really like to make it fun for the students and have them publish it. Now with technology, especially, you know you can do many different kinds of things like movies, PowerPoint presentations, digital animations such as telegami. You can have students actually, you know, type in the words that the, the animator um, person is going to speak. And it makes it a little more fun. I like to do newspapers, have them do a layout, some kind of scrapbooking. But the idea is that they are using images. Images are powerful because after the writing comes the project and then again speaking. Remember, you want to do speaking. So obviously choose the right type. If you're going to do something about travel and vacation spots, a travel brochure, you want to make sure it fits, obviously. What I like to do with travel brochures is have them make a persuasive writing to try to persuade the reader to want to go to that spot. But again, have them present it and present some images. All right, so there are different types of writing. There's narrative, descriptive, expository, persuasive, biographical, I mean, a lot of different kinds of writing. So each different kind of writing has its different components. So you wanna make sure you teach the different types of writing, not all in one unit, maybe just focus on one. For example, again, vacation spots. Let's do a narrative writing about a place you went to, or just to descriptive, describe that place, or just persuasive if they're higher level, try to persuade someone to go there. But again, with the different types of writings, you want to take them through it, teach it, and practice it. Um, with the writing project, I always like to do a writing focus. So when we go through that writing process, you have a grammar focus and a writing focus. The first one is always a thesis statement if you're doing an expository essay. You always want to teach them how to do that, build it in blocks, and then make it a thesis statement. These are some other examples of different writing focuses that you may want to do, but again, spread them out throughout the year. The students are focusing on one thing at a time. Don't expect them to go and write a great essay and have all these things already mastered. 
Another one uh, type of writing that um, often gets left out, it is part of Common Core's functional writing. Here are some ideas of how to maybe have them make a recipe of how to make chocolate chip cookies with some kind of holiday flavoring in it. Or uh, a book review instead of a book report, have them give advice about why this person should read this book or not. Um, letter writing, informal and formal writing is something they need for their daily lives, especially with adult learners. They are going to need this skill if they ever want to apply for a job. Um, invitations to make it fun, plan a party, make an invitation. Notices for events and signs. This is a great skill if you ever want to go into marketing or some kind of writing like that. Now, timed writing is something that we know exists and we always teach it right before test time. It's usually for high stakes exams, but I like to teach it in every unit. If you practice timed writing throughout a year, they don't feel like it's something stressful at the end when they actually take a test. They're already used to doing it. So build it into every unit, but also do it to build writing fluency. Again, students will get used to this writing and they'll get used to being fluent so they can um, continue to write. So just to wrap up, tips for writing. My favorite is Writer's Workshop. I always tell teachers, break up the writing in pieces. Give me the conclusion. Give me body paragraph one. Not in that order, obviously. But the idea is that students are doing a paragraph at a time, having you look at it, meaning you are sitting down with that student while they're writing, and giving them feedback. Again, one grammar focus, one problem they're having, not all of them. And have them make sure the next one that they, next paragraph, that they don't have those same errors. Informal grading versus formal grading. Informal grading is always about content and fluency. Formal grading, then you can grade the grammar. Then you can grade the spelling and sentence structure because you may have taught some of it or edited it already. Correction and feedback, be very careful with ELLs. Don't overwhelm them. They'll only remember one to two things at a time. So you want to focus on that and make sure they do it really well. So that concludes our webinar in Speaking to build writing fluency. Um, thank you for joining us. I do want to mention we have some great posters for the writing process that you can hand out or hang up in your classrooms or hand out to other teachers. They're on our website, www.thesisintl.com, as well as our past webinars. If you'd like to go back and see the rest of the series, you can go there. If you have ever have any questions, I'm Brenda Huey Rosas, and my email is below, brosas at thesisintl.com. I would love to hear your feedback and also answer any questions from you. And if I feel it's a great topic, I might write a blog about it. So thank you so much again, and this concludes our series in teaching ELL, ESL to multi-level classes. Have a great day.